Hey there, I'm Emily. Welcome to City Church. We're so glad you chose to worship with us this morning. We believe that God has something in store for you and we ask that you be open to let God speak to you today. Today, we are honored and excited to have with us comedian, speaker, and now author, Taylor Johnson. How are you guys doing this morning? Can I get everyone to stand up, everyone to stand for a moment? Uh, I really appreciate what Chris said and kind of introducing the rest of service that God's not done speaking to us yet. Uh, I really believe that God still speaks today, that there is a God first and foremost, which is kind of like, I don't know, in the world that we live in today, that itself is kind of a strange belief to have to a lot of people, that there is a God who created us, who actually loves us and cares about us to know us who cares about us so much that he's willing to be in the room with us right now. And not only that, is willing to speak to us and guide us and pull us closer to him because he knows that the, the safest and most incredible place that we can be is close to him. And so I believe that this morning God can draw us closer to him, can push us and pull us, tug on our hearts and bring us closer to him. That God will speak to us if we are listening. And maybe not just speak to you for you, but maybe speak to you for somebody else in your life. Maybe somebody else around you. Because that is one of the most important things about church, is that it's together. That we're all in this room together. No matter who you are outside the walls of this church, no matter what teams you like, preferences you have, where you came from, how much you make, in here, right now, we have the most incredible thing in common. That Jesus has saved us and changed us. And so to the outside world, a lot of us in this room, the idea of us hanging out and the idea of us caring for each other and being in a group together and spending time together seems so strange because what do you have in common with that person? Why would you hang out with somebody that much older than you? You're in your 20s. You're young. Why are you hanging out with a retired couple? And, or whatever the combination might be that seems so strange, the number one most important thing that we have in common is Jesus. And we're a family. We're a family in Christ, that the people around you are your brothers and sisters who can encourage you when you need it and who will encourage and who will, ex wait, what? Who will encourage you when you need it and who will need your encouragement as well. Ugh, that was difficult. <laughs> We're all here together. So maybe God will speak to you this morning for you or maybe it will be for the person sitting next to you. Maybe the person across the room. Or maybe somebody who hasn't been here for a while. Or maybe your neighbor, or maybe a relative, or maybe somebody in your life. But if we're open to it, God will speak to us. I really, truly believe it. So let's just take a moment now, quietly, to ourselves, and pray. And just in your own way, in your own words, like you would be talking to your best friend, tell God, I'm open, and I want to hear from you. Let's just take 10 seconds to do that now. God, thank you so much that you are here in this room with us, that you would never let us go, that there's nothing in our life that would ever make you change your mind about us, and you want to speak to us, whether we knew it coming into the service or not, whether we've been coming for years or this is our first time in a church in a long time, that there's no prerequisite, there's no, like, you don't earn the right to hear God's voice. So thank you that you're going to speak this morning. In your holy name I pray, amen. You guys can all be seated. Uh, so my name is Taylor. Uh, it is true, I am a stand-up comedian. Uh, I also travel and speak in churches. I know a lot of times when a guest speaker comes, uh, they start by kind of telling people a little bit about themselves. They will show a picture of their spouse, show a picture of their kids, and they're all wearing matching outfits, and everyone looks all nice and sweet, and you learn a little bit about them by seeing a picture of their family. I don't have that. I do not have a family. I am single, ladies. I'm not, um, <laughs> so I can't show, I don't have a picture of my family. So instead, I'm going to show you pictures of the time I went to Disney World by myself. So go ahead. There I am. Wow, what a wonderful time I had. 
that's something I'm able to do because I don't have a wife and kids. Uh, yep, there's me meeting my hero. Uh, there's Darth Vader. Uh, then you can go to the next one. Uh, I felt like a real creep because I was by myself and I was an adult and she talked to me like she was Cinderella and I wanted to be like, stop, I know you're not. Um, but it was great. That was the greatest week of my life. That was at the beginning of September. I got to go to Disney World. I, it'd been, it was a trip I'd been planning for two years. I really wanted to go. I, wanted, I, I kept telling myself I wanted to work so hard I deserved to go to Disney World. And so for uh, two years, I worked. And I was saving up money. And then uh, the van that I had died. And so all the money I was saving had to go towards getting a new vehicle. And so I had to start over at the beginning of this year. And I had just been saving up and saving up and saving up. And Disney World was somewhere that I went a lot as a kid. My family, we didn't like spend a lot of money on a lot of nice things. We would just kind of save money for vacations. That was a big deal. And I don't know, I just loved the theme parks. I love how the, the attention to detail in every aspect of your experience as a guest has been thought through and they have made it perfect for what they want you to experience in the park. And so I had like the greatest week of my life. It was uh, the week right after the hurricane was supposed to hit Orlando and it didn't, it didn't hit it. And so everybody who was afraid of the hurricane canceled their trip to Disney World. And I was like, I'm ready to die for this. So I still went. And er no one was there. Like there was one night, I swear there were only a hundred people in the park. Like it was empty. I was like the rapture had happened. And I was like, good, glad, get them out of here. This is exciting. It was the greatest week. I loved it so much. I had so much fun. I cried when I had to leave because it was just great. And uh, I already started to plan like, man, I really want to go back. How can I find a way to go back? What excuse can I come up with to get to go back? Because there's a new ride that's opening. None of you guys care about this, but there's a new ride that's opening in December. It's a Star Wars ride. And I met a lot of people who worked at Disney World while I was there. And everyone said it's going to be the most incredible ride that has ever been made for a theme park. And so like, ooh, I am so pumped for this ride. It comes out December 5th. And I was trying to figure out how can I go back? How can I go back? And I have a friend who's actually going in January. And he's going to go and run the Disney Marathon. And I was like, ooh, maybe I could do that. Maybe, maybe that could be a good excuse. In the beginning of January, I could go. I'd like run a marathon. You run through all four of the parks. That would be awesome. But then there was a part of my brain that was like, Taylor, you've never worked out seriously in your life. I just, I'm not. I just, I, I'm bad at setting goals. I have a lot of things that I would like to have happen, but I'm not doing anything about to make it happen. Like, I would love to have abs. Ooh, I would love to have a six pack. Like if I just rip my shirt off right now, just like pow, just like abs everywhere. I don't have that. I have the opposite. If I rip my shirt off right now, like two of you would throw up. Like that's where we're at. And I'm not doing anything about it to make it happen either. Every night I just rub Whataburger on my stomach. Just like, yes, I'm not gonna get abs that way. And so like the idea of like working out and like running, that seemed insane to me. But I was like, ah, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe. And I was looking at the Disney World's uh, the marathon's website, and then I saw that there are charities that have partnered with Disney World, and you can actually run for a charity and raise money to support that charity as you train to get ready for the marathon. And I was looking at the list, and there is a charity for suicide prevention. And that one really hit home for me. And then it kind of hit me like, oh, this could be about something so much more than me just getting to go back to ride a certain ride. I can do this to support a cause that means a whole lot to me. And it means a lot to me because that is something that's been a part of my story. I grew up in church, but I didn't really talk to anybody about what was going on in my life for a very long time. Because one, I didn't fully understand what was going on in my life. Two, I didn't think anybody else was experiencing what was going on in my life. And three, I thought nothing good could come from me opening up. I didn't know how to deal with depression or anxiety. I didn't know what these thoughts were that were going on in my head. I just knew that it made me feel the worst I've ever felt in my entire life. And it didn't make sense. Why am I so sad? It's not like my family is messed up, like the home life isn't bad. Nothing really terrible is happening in my life. There's no reason for me to feel this way, so why do I feel this way? And I didn't hear anybody else talk about these things in their life. And actually, it kind of felt like in church, everybody else was doing a whole lot better than me. It was like everybody else was a perfect Christian, and I was just playing a part. Like, I had to, like, put on a show 
to be as perfect as everybody else while secretly trying to deal with my junk. But everybody else seems so perfect. And then I also thought, like, why? what good is going to come from me sharing? Because while I was in it, it felt like you will never not feel this way. The way that you feel right now, how bad you feel right now, you're going to feel this way for the rest of your life forever. And so if I were to open up about it, it's not like anything good can come from that. It would just create a bigger mess. Now more people are going to know. Now people are going to look at me weird. Now nobody's going to really want to talk to me or hang out with me. I'm going to be labeled depression guy. So I might as well just keep it to myself because nothing is going to change from me talking about it. So I'll just keep it to myself. And I thought that that would take care of it, but it didn't. It made it worse. At times, from junior high and high school, I tried self-harm. And there were times from junior high and high school and into college that I got very close to taking my own life. Until, when I was in college, somebody told me about what they had gone through in their life. And it was exactly what I was going through at that time. So I was no longer alone. And also, I was so surprised to hear that this person had gone through it because they, it didn't, it didn't look like they could possibly have been one of those people. They, they weren't like me. They, they seemed like they were, they were doing great. And they were. Because they weren't dealing with it in the same way that they, I had anymore. That they were like on the other side of it. That they had learned how to get through this time in their life. And things had actually changed, which I did not believe was possible. I thought, I will be this way forever. Nothing could possibly change. And I saw in somebody else that things could change. And they could change because of Jesus. And that was the first time I ever felt like I could talk to somebody about what was going on in my life. That was the first time I felt like I can let my walls down, I can open up, and I can share with somebody about what's going on in my life. And, and what I believed turned out to be so wrong that once I shared, then I could actually start to deal with it. There is a quote from Mr. Rogers. that He says, anything that is mentionable can be more manageable. If you can talk about it, you can deal with it. If you can wrap words around it, if you can say something, if you can admit that there is this thing that exists, then you can actually start to deal with it. So that changed my life. And then it got to a point where uh, I started traveling and speaking. I, I, I felt called into ministry when I was in the eighth grade, but I didn't know what it would look like. I was really close with my youth pastor, and I was also very close with the children's pastor who was there at the time, who was a, a, an evangelist for children's ministries. And as I got older, he let me, like, travel with him. And uh, there was a group of us who traveled, and we would do, like, skits and stuff. And I was also really close to my youth pastor, and I, I didn't know what it would look like. And then when I was in high school, I started doing stand-up. I really liked doing stand-up. And I got to college, and I met, I met someone who also did stand-up in churches, and he ended his stand-up shows with a message. I saw him do a show, and at the end, he had made people laugh for a really long time, and then he, he told the gospel. I didn't know you were allowed to do that. It was crazy. I got everyone laughing, and so people's walls came down, people's defenses came down, and like the moment it went from funny to serious, you felt the room shift, and everybody was paying such close attention. And I thought that that was the most incredible thing in the world. From that moment on, that's what I wanted to do. And so now I go into churches, conferences, camps. I make people laugh. I tell embarrassing stories about myself so that I can get to a point where I can talk about vulnerability. The importance of opening up and talking to people about what's going on in your life. Letting your walls and your defenses down. Letting people in to see parts of your life that you might not normally feel comfortable sharing with people. Whether it's weakness, whether it's just parts of your life that feel more sensitive, it kind of feels like it's a risk to show it to somebody else because you don't know how they're going to respond or how they're going to react to that. Maybe that's the thing that makes them change their mind about you. So most people, we want to keep it away from. But if we want change to happen in that area, we have to be willing to find people that we can trust to open up to and to talk to them about what's going on in our lives. So for the last seven years, that's been what I've been doing is traveling and speaking on this topic. This year, I actually uh, put out a book. It's called In the All Together, Trusting God with All We Hide from the World. And this is kind of everything that I've been doing in ministry has been leading up to this book, a book about vulnerability and the life of the church and the life of a Christian, why we need it, why we're afraid of it, and why we don't have to be. 
And I've got a bunch uh, back there that are going to be on sale after service. It's $13, and you can pay with cash or card. But the weirdest thing about putting this book out was after, t after, after I'd finished a draft, I would like write the first draft of the book, and then I wrote the second draft. And the second draft, I felt like it was good enough to share with a couple of people because I wanted to get feedback. I wanted to make sure I was on the right track. My first draft was terrible. It was awful, which is what it should be. When you're writing a book, the first draft is supposed to be like the throw-up draft. You're just like, get it out. Just like, ah, just write the worst thing possible so that you can get it on paper and then you can fix it later. So the second draft, I fixed it. I fixed some of the mistakes. I changed some stuff around. It felt like it was kind of maybe a little bit good enough to share with a couple of people. So I had two friends. One was a pastor. One was a, a, a Christian counselor. And I sent it to them to get their feedback. And they read it, and both of them, without knowing the other one said it, they, they said the exact same compliment. They said, man, I, I really enjoyed it. If I ever had somebody in my life who was going through a difficult time, I would definitely recommend your book to them. And in the moment, I thought that was the nicest thing that they could say. That's a really incredible compliment. That carries a lot of weight because one's a pastor, one's a counselor, and they would recommend this book. That's awesome. But then a couple of days later, a couple of weeks later, I, I thought about that compliment more and more, and I started to not like it. I started to hate that. I couldn't figure out what it was about it that made me not like it so much. And then I, I realized that it kind of points out this problem that we have with vulnerability in the church. A lot of the time, we think vulnerability is only for rock bottom. The time that you're supposed to open up to somebody else about what's going on in your life is when things are at their worst, when you are at your lowest, and everything else that you've tried on your own has not worked. As a last resort, that's when you open up to somebody else about what's going on. So the people who are really going through something difficult, they're the ones who need to open up. So if it's only for special occasions, then we can treat it like an event. So like if you grow up in church, you go off to youth camp, there's that one night at youth camp where the speaker talks about dealing with the junk in your life, and that's your chance. Anybody who's at rock bottom, the very select special few who need to open up about their junk, tonight's your night to do it. Or if you get older, maybe it's at a conference or a retreat, or maybe just one special Sunday morning service where, okay, the ones who really need it, you can come down and you can deal with your junk. And I think we like to think about vulnerability that way, because we can kind of paint ourselves outside of the picture. We can kind of put this frame around who needs to be vulnerable about what's going on in their life. And we can do it in a way that we don't belong in the picture. Because there's always somebody who's worse off who needs to open up. There's always somebody else who's really going through something really bad. The one, man, uh, the, yeah, that guy, Taylor, talked about being suicidal. That's who needs to open up. That's who needs to talk to somebody else about what's going on in their life. Everybody, everybody else, all the rest of us, we don't really need to do it. Only when things get really bad. But that's not at all the way Christ, the way God talks about our relationship with him, our relationship with the church. Scripture makes it very clear that our entire lives as Christians is meant to be lived vulnerably. That we should be vulnerable with God and with the church in our everyday lives. Even coming to Christ, even beginning that relationship with him, is it starts from a very vulnerable place because you're admitting, I cannot do it on my own. I can't get it on my own. I can't be the Lord of my own life. I need you to be in charge. You be in charge. You tell me how to treat other people, how to treat myself. I, I have made so much damage by being in charge of my own life. I want you to be in charge now. I can't save myself. Only you can save me. To start your life as a Christian, you have to admit weakness. In the rest of your life, you have to accept that you are still weak and God is still the one who is strong. Man, your ability to love others comes from him changing you. Your ability to forgive others, to have joy in difficult situations, your ability to run away from sin all comes from him. It's not us doing this on our own. It's him doing it through us. And like I said, we're a family. We're supposed to rely on each other. 
in America, we love independence. We love it so much. We root for independence all the time. The idea of the American dream is you pull yourself up from your bootstraps. You start your own business. You do it all on your own. It was all on you. You did it yourself. That's what we think is incredible. Somebody being dependent, ugh, that's embarrassing. Somebody having to rely on other people. Somebody needing to ask for help. Somebody who's not take, able to take care of themselves, that's something we see as weakness and a problem, and we, we think it's embarrassing. But man, there are times in Scripture where it says that there, that there are Christians who will need to rely on the church financially. But to us, that sounds so embarrassing. That sounds terrible. I don't want to do that. Just like Chris was saying, we want to think that we've got it on our own. But to come to Christ means to admit that you can't. You can't have it on your own. That we need God and we need the church. And sometimes when things are going great in our life, it's hard to see how true that is. Because rock bottom is a very eye-opening experience. It is a time when we do a really good job of examining just what we've done to get us there. And for a lot of people, rock bottom is important. When everything has gone crashing in, a lot of times that's when we first see clearly that we don't have it on our own. But we don't have to wait for rock bottom. There's this passage uh, in Matthew chapter 7. This is Jesus at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and this is what he says. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. So this parable of two men, metaphor of one who does the will of God, does, follows his words, and the one who doesn't. Two different men who build two different houses on two different foundations, both going through the exact same storm, which I think is such an important point that Jesus is making, that the storms of life come for all of us. It's not like once you come to Christ, all storms go away and your life is perfect from then, that point on. No, storms still show up. But what's so incredible about our relationship with God is that now, with him on our side and with us being in him and listening to him and following him, those storms don't affect us the exact same way anymore. Storms that used to destroy us or destroy marriages or destroy families or destroy your, your emotional state, destroy your relationships with other people. Now, because you're in Christ, when that storm comes, you can survive it and you can get through it and that storm can actually make you stronger. Storms still come, and they will always come. And that's hard for us to see a lot of times when things are going great. Or even for me, I think any season of life, it's hard to remember that that season will not last forever. Like I said, when I felt depressed, when I felt at my lowest, I believed I'm going to feel this way forever. Nothing will ever change. I will never not feel this way. Same is true also when times are going really great. I have to really force myself to remember, I feel great right now. Everything is going awesome in my life financially, with relationships, with my family, with my relationship with God. Everything is going really great right now. But I have to remind myself, like, hey, this is not going to last forever. Something is going to come. Whether it's from inside or outside, something is going to happen that is going to disrupt this. And, and this season is not going to last forever. This too shall pass. And I think a lot of times when we're in a really good season, when everything's really going great, we can kind of push to the side a lot of things that we know that we need. We really see that we need when we hit rock bottom. But when things are going great, no, 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 everything is fine. I can kind of be a little more, more lax on the things of my life. Because we think that either the storm will never come, that everything's going great, or we think we know how we're going to handle when a storm comes. We have a really good idea of who we are and how we're going to handle it on our own. We know what we are going to do. Because a lot of times we see other people go through storms and go through problems. And we can kind of look down on them. We see people have like a moral failure or, or have moments of doubt or fall away from the church because of something in their life. And we kind of look at them and think, man, how'd you let that happen? Man, what, that's ridiculous. I can't believe it. How could somebody do that? That's a, that's a big thing that we like to say. How could somebody do that? We have a plan in our mind of how we think we would handle the similar storms. 
I love this quote from Mike Tyson. He says, everybody's got a plan until you get punched in the face. I love that. Everybody's got a plan until you get punched in the face. You go into a fight, you've got all these ideas, all these strategies on how you're going to handle this. You know exactly what you're going to do. But the moment you get punched in the face, all of that goes out the window. You don't have time to think anymore. And all that you are left with is all of the training that you did leading up to that fight. All of the time and effort and work, the muscle memory, because you did it over and over and over again, that it's just kind of the instincts that you have built and caused to grow in your life, all you're left with is everything that you did leading up to that fight to take over because you don't have time to think. The plan goes out the window when you get punched in the face. All of us have a plan until life punches us in the face. And when it happens, it all goes out the window. And you can find yourself saying the same things that you have judged others for saying. You've seen other very strong Christians crying and saying, what kind of God would let this happen to me? And you're like, what are you talking about? You know, you know what type of God, and you try to like throw scripture at them and none of it works. And you'd think, how could somebody think that until life punches you in the face? See, in this story, that there's, there's, there's two men that build their houses and there's a time of building, and there's a time of waiting out the storm. When things are going great in your life, that is still an important time to still be obedient to God and to still trust him more than you trust yourself. That's a great time to start testing the foundation of the house that you have built, to see just how strong it is, to start building habits in your life, to start trusting God with more areas of your life than you might not normally, with financially, relationally? Do you have people in your life right now who know you 100%? Do you have people in this church right now who are discipling you? Do you have someone in your life that you're discipling? Do you have someone that you can go to who knows the sin that you've dealt with, who knows what your family has gone through, who knows your fears? Because those relationships, when you build them while the sky is blue, that's going to be the relationship that helps you when the storm comes. The relationship with the church, the relationship with God. You start building that house when the sky is blue. You start trusting God. You start being obedient. Doing the words that he says. Even Jesus does a great job of illustrating that for us in his own life. In the Gospels, you see over and over again uh, these stories where Jesus is in front of a large crowd and he ministers to them and he's preaching and then afterwards he kind of goes off alone to pray. And it kind of like is a weird like extra sentence. It feels like it doesn't really add to the narrative. Why is this there? And another time, all these people come to hear Jesus. He preaches to them. He shares the Gospel and then he goes off alone to pray. He's with a lot of people. Then he sneaks off and finds a place to go alone to pray. When the skies are blue, when everybody is really excited to hear Jesus speak, he does this over and over and over again. And then, one night, at dinner, with his disciples, he tells them all that he is going to be killed the next day. And he's going to be betrayed by one of his followers. And Jesus knows that he is coming up face to face to the moment that he came down to earth for his sacrifice his suffering for our sins. It is going to be the, the scariest, the most intense, the darkest moment of his life. And what does he do that night? He sneaks off, he gets alone, and he prays. And it's a good thing he does too because he has a very honest conversation with God where he even says, hey, is there another way? Could this pass? He wrestles with God over this moment that he knows that he has been called here to do. And because he has been so good at building his house, the perfect house, on the perfect foundation, in his darkest moment, when life has punched him in the face, he goes back to the thing that he has always done, and he goes off alone and he prays. Not only that, he goes with other disciples and he says, hey, can you guys pray for me? I am going through the darkest night of my life, and I need you guys to pray for me, which is crazy that Jesus does that. Jesus is vulnerable with his friends. 
Jesus asks other people to pray for him. Man, if Jesus, if Jesus needs to do that, what makes me think that I don't? But in the good times, he built his house, which he needed to for that moment when instinct takes over and you go off alone to pray. And at the end of his prayer, he says, your will, not mine. And he goes willingly to die on the cross for us. Things are going great. It's a good time to look at the foundation of your house, to look at the house that you're building, because things won't always go great. <sighs> Having people in your life who know you. See, vulnerability, we think like, oh, just for like your deepest, darkest secrets. But really, to open up to somebody and say, hey, I think this is what God is calling me to do, or I think God wants me to get involved in this ministry, or I think God is calling me to do this. That's a vulnerable place to be. You're admitting that you think God is calling you to do something? Like, ooh, what, what if they don't like that? Like, what if they laugh at you? Like, oh, that's a vulnerable, you're exposing kind of a sensitive part of yourself. To apologize to someone, that's a very vulnerable position to be in. You have to admit that you've done wrong. And you have to ask for forgiveness. And they don't guarantee that they're going to give you forgiveness. They could use that moment to really stab you and dig it in. Like, you've humbled yourself to apologize, and they could really, like, put the knife in. It's a risky situation, but it's vulnerable. But it's what God has called us to do. To forgive someone else, that's a vulnerable position. To confront someone. To admit when you're wrong. To evaluate the things that you've been doing and saying and the way that you've been living and to admit that some of it might actually be sin and against what God has called you to do. That's a very vulnerable place to be. And it's all things that we need to be doing when the sky is blue. Jesus is inviting us, asking us, come and build your house on me. Come and build your entire life on me. Not just this part of your life when things go bad. Come and build your entire life on me. He invites us to do that, which is crazy. It's crazy when you think about who it is who is saying this to us. Jesus, who is God, come down to earth in flesh, who was there at the beginning of everything, who saw perfection in earth, in Eden, saw the beauty of, of life without death, who saw the moment that man turned from God and entered into death and sin, who saw God call Abraham and Israel to himself to be his people, who saw every time that Israel turned their back on him, turned their back, turned their back and rebelled, turned their back and manipulated other people, turned their back and hurt creation that God had made, who, who, who just saw every evil act of man, who knew it all, who knew exactly what he was getting himself into with the type of people he was getting it into with. And he still looks at them all and says, I want you to come to me, to build your life on me. I want you to be my family. I want you to belong in me. And in order for him to say that, and for it to even be possible, he had to die. Not for a group of people who were incredible, the best of the best of the best. No, the worst of the worst, the enemies of God. If he was willing to do it for Israel, he's willing to do it for me. And if he's willing to do it for me, he's willing to do it for you. Because maybe you're not in a blue skies moment right now. Maybe you're even, the only reason you're at church is because... You've got a storm. Life has punched you in the face. It is never too late to come to Jesus. It is never too late. You can't shock him, surprise him, freak him out, make him change his mind about you. If he says you can come and build your life on me, if he's ever said that, he will always say that. To every single one of us in here, you can exchange the foundation of sand that you've been building on for the foundation of a rock. You don't have to follow the same patterns over and over and over again for the rest of your life. Things can change. Change is possible. Can we all stand?
So again, I just want us to take, take a moment to allow God to speak to us. Maybe for some of you, because uh, that's the thing, like when we talk about vulnerability and if we treat it like it's uh, just for special, special occasions and just for events, then when you talk about it in church, the response time has to be like this huge emotional, like long cathartic experience because everyone's like throwing up all their emotions. It doesn't have to be that way. And it's not going to be that way today. Maybe what God is going to tell you to do is kind of set up a lunch with somebody here at church that you kind of know pretty well, but there's a lot about your life that they don't know. And you want to have somebody from your family, this family, in your corner. And you want to be there for them. So maybe it's God's going to tell you to set up a time to hang out with somebody, to get lunch with somebody. Maybe it's God's going to set up a time for you to get alone with his word and to just start reading, reading the things that Jesus talks about. And maybe that's your way of testing the foundation that you've been building on, just seeing how sturdy it really is. Or maybe you're in the middle of a storm and today is the day that you want to turn to Christ. You can do that with just a simple conversation that you have with him. And maybe after that conversation, you can have a conversation with a leader here in this church because we're supposed to depend on God and each other. So let's just take a moment now. I, I, I didn't know that in worship that they were going to do a song that, is, that references this passage. I didn't know that. That's awesome. That's crazy. God, he's working. So we're just going to sing this. And as we do, just ask God to speak to you. How is he drawing you closer to him today? And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I following the words that he says, listening and obeying, not just out of a sense of obligation because like that's the price you have to pay if you want to get into heaven, but because he is a good and loving father who is not just telling you tasks to do to prove yourself worthy, but because he loves you and he knows you, he knows the path of life to walk. He knows the troubles and difficulties that will be around you, so he knows how to prepare you for them. So it might feel like a strange request. It might feel like a strange commandment to follow him in places he's asking you to go, but it's not just to prove yourself worthy. It's because where he's taking you, he's taking you there because he loves you. And you will stand strong while all the other houses crumble under the same storm. And everyone else who will see your house and it will blow their mind. How could somebody possibly make it through that? How could somebody possibly make it through another miscarriage and yet they're still a strong family? And yet they still are loving and full of joy? How could that be possible? And you can look at them and tell them about the foundation that you have built your life on. When you build your life on him, suffering is no longer meaningless. There's purpose to it. God can use it for incredible acts of love to show all the other people who have built their houses around yours that in him, incredible change is possible. 
that no other foundation of life could ever offer. And today is a day to take a step closer to him and take a step closer to the people in the family around you because we need each other. They need you. The people around you, they need you. Because, yeah, things might be going great in your life right now, but it might not be going great in theirs, and they need you, and you need them. So there's a class happening right after this. That's a perfect opportunity. Learn more about that. Just 30 minutes. Take a step closer. Letting your walls down is not just for when things are at their worst. It's for our everyday lives. If you're interested in this topic, the book, uh, it's about that. Why we need it in our everyday lives, why we're afraid of it, and why we don't have to be. Because I'm a comedian, I wanted to make it the funniest book on one of the most uncomfortable topics. Because like to say, like, read this book on vulnerability, like, ugh, that doesn't sound fun at all. Nobody wants to do that. But I try to add humor and make it silly. And So I'll be back there if you want to talk, if you want to get a book. It's $13. Take cash or card. That's it. Let me pray and we'll be dismissed. God, thank you so much that you are here and you are speaking and you are listening and you have watched each and every person in this room as they've gone about this week. You've known everything in their life that has led up to this moment where you want to speak to them. God, I just pray that we are all listening. Help us to hear you and help us to act on what you say. God, for anybody in here who is feeling right now that you're giving them a a, a special word or just something to say to someone else, God, I pray that they just step out in that obedience, even though it can feel weird, it can feel awkward to say, hey, I feel like God wants me to tell you this. God, I pray that we're just open. We're just open to hearing your voice and to following your lead because we know that you are love us and you are trustworthy. In your holy name I pray, amen.